Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Elina Egle, Lloyd Schmele. I'm a chairperson of the Federation of Security and Defense Industries of Latvia. And I have the great honor today to have one hour debate about public-private partnership and its role for national security. And today with me, I have, I think, very experienced speakers. And I just think that this one hour wouldn't be enough. But uh, let's, let's do our best to uh, engage uh, all of us in, in the debate. So I would like also to ask you to raise the questions or some, uh, some ideas if you have some. So, uh, and at first I would like to introduce you with uh, Susan. So Susan Rain uh, writes and speaks on terrorism, risk analy analysis and warning. She's a visiting professor in the Department of War Studies at King's College Center and works uh, in London and works uh, at the Center of Geopolitics at Cambridge University. Susan told me that I, I shouldn't tell all what he ha she has done uh, because it will take quite a lot of time, but I think it, it is a really impressive experience in counterterrorism area uh, and uh, threat assessment. I think these are the things where we really could uh, learn a lot from you. Uh, from La Latvia, from Latvian business, we have Yuris Binde, and for Latvian people, I think it's no necessity to uh, to talk about uh, uh, him. But for our international partners, I still would like to introduce uh, uh, you with him, because for 30 years he's president and CEO of Latvian Mobile Telephone, and he has also his uh, knowledge rooted in uh, in technology. So he has been previously chief technologist and head of technology department in Scientific Research Institute, WEF. And uh, currently uh, he's uh, also doing, uh, let's say, academical work. He is a visiting professor in uh, Vidzemes uh, High School and he's doctor of economics. And having also several leading positions in business community, uh, being part of uh, Latvian Telecommunication Association and Employers Confederation of Latvia. So, and what's also worth to say that probably um, mainly uh, we think that Latvian mobile telephone is working in telecommunication area, but I think that Yuris will have experience to share regarding other uh, communication uh, activities, what they are doing to engage society in technologies, and also working quite long time uh, for defense, uh, defense uh, industry ecosystem uh, uh, in Latvia. And uh, with us, we have a colleague and friend from Ukraine, so Mikola Bieleskov. So he's senior uh, analyst at the NGO, Come Back Alive. And uh, I, I know that your foundation is doing an amazing job for, for your army. And I also know that uh, Latvian company has also been, been part of the uh, foundation project. So uh, your foundation uh, have doing this charity job and uh, 100 drones from Atlas are also used by, uh, by Ukrainian uh, uh, army. And thanks for that. Thanks for job what you're doing. And I think that your presence will also help us uh, to activate the donations and charity so that we are not getting, uh, uh, getting slow with support. So welcome, Michael. Yes, so, uh, and on behalf of uh, Federation of Security and Defense Industries of Latvia, first of all, I would like, like to say also thanks to the organizers and sponsors of this event, uh, because of, for the first time we also had an opportunity to bring a business perspective on, on this uh, stage, uh, where we mainly concentrate on international security debates, and we have also a great opportunity to showcase, at least make small snap snapshot of Latvian industry, what we are doing uh, here in Latvia, how we support our army, our police, our critical infrastructure, so that uh, we are more connected with, with, with the ground. And uh, what's also probably for the beginning of debate, uh, I think this public-private partnership as a term has usually been quite narrow, <laughs> if I may say so, because we talk just about the contracts, about procurements, but I think when we are talking about security, we are talking about something much, much more. And uh, I think that uh, 
national security, it's not the responsibility of army, of police, of uh, fire and rescue services, intelligence agencies. Basically, that responsibility lies on each of us. And I think that experience, what uh, also Mikolas is having, it's just a proof that it's not just uh, like army and services, but that's business community, that's uh, uh, researchers, non-governmental institutions. We all have our role and responsibility to take. So, and um, uh, during this autumn, um, we as a, as a federation, we have had a chance to uh, visit our largest municipalities and uh, raise issues about resilience, about business continuity, and uh, at the same time, also uh, our Ministry of Defense, we're organizing these continuous uh, trainings to understand what kind of uh, vulnerab vulnerabilities we basically have and uh, what, what should we do with them, especially taking into account this experience, what, what we see right now in Ukraine. And uh, I think that those eight months have shown the bravery of Ukrainians, uh, in, in any aspects which we could just think. And uh, that really uh, re reminds us to think that uh, we have to think much more wider about the potential threats. And uh, we understand that probably we wouldn't be able to respond to every threat. We, we, it's impossible. But at least we can, uh, we can evaluate where those risks are and be prepared. And uh, yeah, therefore, basically, my first question would be probably to Susan uh, to ask, uh, how do you think, um, what about our uh, risk assessment, risk management, risk awareness? Uh, and yeah, starting also probably from, from UK, how is it in Great Britain? What's what they're worried about, what <laughs> Brits are worried about. Um, well, thank you very much, and it's, it's delightful to be here. I'm, I, I speak with, with great humility in this because uh, I think in the UK we're not good at it particularly. I think it's terrific that Mikolai is here because what we're seeing, some of the things we're going to talk about, about resilience and, and innovation, we're seeing Ukraine demonstrating how it should be done in a way that we have struggled. Um, but I, I'm going to start, I think, with just framing some of the, some of the things that I think about are, are sort of, of missing, certainly um, in the UK, perhaps. Um, the British Chief of Defence Staff gave a speech this week where he said, we need to be war fit. Uh, so that's good. To meet the demands of state-on-state -state competition, better supported by resilient supply chains and greater capacity in our industrial base, which means being more agile, um, reducing our tendency for bespoke procurements when we should simply go shopping instead. And I think we've all probably heard all of our defence ministers uh, and chiefs of the military saying basically the same thing. And they come, they say, we need to be more agile, we need to buy stuff, um, we need to increase our ability to respond. And I've been, you know, I've been on the public side of the public-private partnership, but you say, well, how are you more agile? And when you go shopping, how do you make sure that the things that you need are in the shops? And that's the question, I think, that, that we need to address, because it, it's very... It's very difficult to set up the systems that you need to be agile, because actually you need to break a lot of the systems to be able to be agile, I think. So, so Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shown us that we need that public-private partnership to work like it's never worked before, as you said. It's got, it's got to move to a whole different level of... Um, of mutual reliance, and that depends on common purpose and a shared understanding of what the threat looks like. And it also requires common understanding of each other's capability. It's very difficult if you've been in government service all your life to understand manufacturing or technology or the finance industry. And it's very difficult if you've been in the finance, if you're a private equity person, to understand how government takes decisions. So, so that lack of understanding makes everything so much harder. It makes it difficult for governments to know what to buy or how to, and it makes it difficult for people to, 
to speak into the decision makers. So we can talk a bit more about then how that leads to issues about protection and um, and responsibility, if you want, but I don't want to talk for too long now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Yuris, how do you think, how far we are right now with risk management, risk assessment, probably in national le level, probably in industry level, or probably in a company level where you feel more comfortable? Oh, yeah, uh, it's quite an interesting question because uh, it's uh, not a homogeneous uh, environment and uh, even in the uh, frame of uh, one industry there are s several and different uh, approaches and uh, risk levels. So uh, for sure the uh, most advanced are technological companies which have uh, very serious uh, ICT systems. Uh, but this is, uh, of course, opportunity uh, during the peacetime how to manage the company, how to provide the services and so on, to uh, arrange all the planning. Uh, however, the, uh, one of the ser most serious threats nowadays is uh, cyber security. Uh, and uh, talking about cyber security, the number of cyber attacks increased not by percentage, but uh, tens and hundreds times. Uh, maybe these uh, cyber attacks are not so uh, dangerous for the uh, high-tech companies, for the professional companies with the serious IT and security departments. Uh, however, for the most of the companies, it's a really, really big threat. And we saw uh, in the world a lot of examples when the uh, hackers are paralyzing some uh, 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 fuel pipelines in the United States and the opposite uh, is uh, when in Russia on the petrol stations there is some slogan against Putin. So this is uh, uh, these are the different uh, issues. The second critical issue is uh, deliveries. Deliveries of the components, raw materials uh, and uh, we faced very very hard with this problem uh, uh, in the situation when the war was not in place, when the pandemic started and when the main the supplier of the radio electronic equipment or radio electronic components from China and uh, uh, Southeast Asia were in fact paralyzed. And it paralyzed uh, Europe, European production. Uh, when the war started, of course, uh, again, for Ukraine, it's a different situation than for Europe. The fuel consumption, deliveries, prices, all these issues are, are very, very vulnerable and, uh, on all the levels, starting from the governments, from the uh, policy makers, from the international institutions, there have to be the clear vision how to tackle these risky things. Because uh, it's uh, well known that if you want to live in peace, you have to be prepared for the war. Exactly. Nicholas, uh, I think it's, it's time for you to step in and probably give us a picture how far with public-private partnerships uh, for security you were and probably be where do you stand right now? Uh, well, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, maybe I should start with uh, making some background contrast because since the mid of 17th century, as we know, state was monopolizing the issue of raising and supplying armies. So it was sole responsibility of the state. And uh, recently we see that this uh, responsibility, this monopoly uh, actually demonopolized and we see a, su a successful case of uh, private uh, public partnership because uh, we are actually charity. So our legal status is a charity organization. We are raising monies, we have uh, close connection with the military and we are meeting their uh, needs and why um, Come Back Alive was so successful because we are biggest charity in Ukraine in terms of money raised, in terms of uh, equipment provided. Why it was so successful because uh, this charity was funded back in May 2014, so when Russia started its war against 
Ukraine in Donbas, low-level conflict, proxy conflict, and so on. So since the time Comeback Ally was active in raising monies, in buying this as that kind of equipment, not only equipment, but also uh, providing skills, uh, teaching uh, soldiers how to use to the fullest possible extent equipment provided. So we uh, previously accumulated a lot of experience and our uh, military department, which is responsible for the cooperation, it has the best uh, cadres in terms of like operation of uh, and utilization of UAVs like sniping, like mortars, like application uh, using different kind of equipment for indirect fire. So. Before 24th of February 2022, it's, we already accumulated a lot of experience, and not only experience, we also uh, have uh, first-hand uh, experience dealing with the military. It was a kind of not vertical uh, uh, links, but horizontal links, and very, uh, very intimate, I would say, uh, connection, relationship with the military, because uh, we, we, we already uh, have the task uh, to uh, confront Russians in the Donbass, to have this joint forces operation and so on. So uh, even uh, before 24th uh, of February 2022, there was a lot of experience, a lot of good relationship we rely on. And also it's about uh, being, being open, uh, about being transparent, because as, uh, uh, as a charity we publish annual reports, so we, we are 100% transparent, we explain to the people uh, for what their money going on, we do it on a monthly basis, definitely it would be kind of a challenge to report for 2022, because right here, right now, up to 5 billion derivatives was raised. It's, it's hundreds of times more than in 2021, but uh, I would say why uh, Comeback Alive is uh, a successful case of uh, public-private partnership, because uh, experience we gained previously, because uh, flexibility was definitely one of the downsides of the state, it's bureaucratic process, we are more flexible, we are more about horizontal, not vertical, links uh, uh, and also about um, uh, trust and confidence because uh, a lot of people uh, in uh, our organization they have military experience including the head of our charity and uh, these are the people of ingenuity whom ukrainians trust basically so it's not only about about this is that cooperation it's a good case how trust is translated into into practical results into providing basic needs because again to emphasize ukrainian security and defense forces would grow almost three times from 300 350 thousand to up to 1 million and definitely any kind of bureaucracy for any kind of bureaucracy it would be a challenge even for most efficient one however we are we don't have most efficient one to to, to, to be honest and at the same time maybe to, to conclude to, to make a contrast, another contrast, you can see how it's difficult for the Russians, which rely only on inefficient bureaucracy, to sustain fighting. So it's also a very, very good example how civil society, how non-governmental organizations, they compensate, they complement. Because definitely we are not going to supplement Ministry of Defense. It's, it's definitely employment of military, of... Uh, of violence, organized violence for political means, it's the responsibility of the state, it's about legitimacy and so on, but you have a very good case how civil society organization is able to, to complement military uh, all along the, uh, the fighting, which is almost eight months, so it's a very good uh, story, and I think uh, it's stories that would be studied carefully, because as I said, Basically, the monopoly of the state of, uh, to raise and sustain armies, I would say, it's not, not broken, but it, it broadened, I would say. So that's, that's the, the case, and that's how we are working, and we are going to do our job. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's true that uh, state budgets uh, have their limitations and uh, that's uh, really up to citizens and also international commu community to, st to step in and uh, give, give support. So uh, listening to what has been said, uh, I'm thinking more and more, okay, what could be probably those driving forces for public-private partnerships to, to start? Because uh, what we also have been hearing uh, during debates, uh, uh, yesterday uh, about resilience. Uh, there was also this um, situation uh, that 
for instance, in Latvia, we still see that in a situation of emergencies, uh, societies rely on state institutions, on army, on national guards. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, we understand that in a real war situation, army should fight. And that's up to us, the civilians, to, to take care of each other and uh, those who are in the, uh, the weakest uh, groups in society. So how to make this boost, this understanding that everybody is having his role uh, to step in? Would, would you go with, with Susan, probably? I've got... I was thinking, I mean, while Mikhail I was talking, I was, I was thinking about something completely different, actually, mm. which I'm just going to briefly say. When you said... Um, <laughs> We're a charity. We're a charity which is essentially providing weapons. Mm -hmm. And in, certainly in the UK, I think uh, through a series of, um, sort of banking regulations, through the ESG agenda, the Environment, Social and Governance agenda, we have um, made it, in many cases, unacceptable to invest in or take funding from oil and gas companies and arms companies for you know to sponsor museums to you know it, it's 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 seen it is seen as socially unacceptable um, in in many quarters. That is obviously having to change because, as everybody keeps saying, you can't have any kind of security if you haven't actually if you're being invaded by Russia. And suddenly, the companies who are most important for the S in ESG, for the society, the social bit of it, are the arms manufacturers and the oil and gas companies. So, so the fact that Mikolai is, is, is from a charity that's supplying weapons, that's a really important mind shift that I think we're all having yeah. to go through and, and having to recognize and esteem. I think some, some of the you know, big famous tech companies won't work with arms companies, won't work with governments and ministries of defence. That's going to have to change if we're going to invent the next phase of tech that we need to keep ourselves safe in the future. Um, so that wasn't the answer to your question, but I think it's a really important thing that, that is going to happen. Um, one of the things... I worked in counterterrorism. The only way that we could keep ourselves as a country, as a society, um, safe during that phase was to make sure that we had a conversation where everybody did know what their role was in the process. So, so we put a lot of effort into understanding the investigation aspect of it. Then we had a proper warning system, which, which had integrity, that was the bit that I did, which mm. said, this is how the threat is changing. We're communicating how the threat is changing. And the second half of any warning system is to have somebody, an organisation, a person who knows that it is their job to respond to the warning. So you need a structure with, with labels on people, say, and that, that works the same with, with flooding or volcanoes or terrorism or Russia invading. You know, you see, we are watching this threat. Now we are telling you it's going to happen. And somebody says, I hear you. I'm going to either do something so that it doesn't happen or I'm going to put in place the response beforehand. I'm going to anticipate and therefore I'm not surprised. And that mentality of saying, we, we acknowledge that these are the threats, we understand what our role is, and we're going to make sure, ideally, we are never surprised because the warning systems work. But if we are surprised, our response is going to be really good because we've practiced it and because we know what it is. So, so so that you can do that more easily in certain areas than others. And, and when you get to kind of geopolitics, to Russia invading places, it seems a lot harder. But I think the principles are the same even then. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, uh, I agree with you, Susan, that there, first of all, uh, have to be the institutional track where, where the government and uh, municipalities are organizing the different uh, processes in the case of emergency. Uh, what you earlier mentioned in the very beginning, that in Latvia there are some problems with uh, this uh, civil, civil defense system. Uh, there is quite a pragmatic explanation, because uh, we are living in a relatively safe environment. We have no avalanches, we have no tornadoes, we have no... 
a very hard flood. We're living next door to Russia. It's not a uh, this, is, <laughs> this is This is another story. I will come to this story <laughs> <coughs> as well. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the uh, war in Ukraine and the fact that the aggressor is next door to us, uh, of course, it's uh, stressing uh, everybody and is pushing to p more uh, effectively uh, to create the system by which is able to work w in the case if it's necessary. Uh, and uh, the defense is not uh, only the military, it's not only the police and uh, border guards and others. It's uh, a national uh, defense system. Uh, where each and everybody is uh, ready to uh, participate in, in the extraordinary situations. Uh, there is a lot of things which uh, have to be solved, for instance, uh, logistics, supplies, uh, heating systems, and uh, uh, all others. And these are not military issues. These are uh, purely civil issues. Uh, in, and in many cases, they are not under control of the government, but under control of the municipalities on a regular basis on a, in, a, in the normal days. Uh, so, and uh, with that, uh, I think that uh, each uh, community and each the company have uh, to uh, create the uh, environment and the system uh, which can be launched and trained, which is the most important. You can know, but if you are not regularly trained uh, in the uh, fire, with the fire alarms in the big buildings, which in our company it, uh, it's several uh, times a year, uh, you have to know where to go, what to do, what to take, who is responsible, which door, and if it's coming to the automatic level, then the system is working. You are avoiding panics, you are avoiding uh, other, other uh, not very smart reaction. And uh, talking about the uh, eventual uh, danger during the uh, military attack. Uh, nowadays it's uh, allowed to establish national guard units in, in the uh, strategic uh, infrastructure uh, companies, uh, which uh, will be in the case of necessity to defend particular object, uh, particular place uh, of uh, strategic importance. Yes. Uh, Mikolas, uh, could you probably tell us uh, your tricks, if I may say so, uh, to engage society, to engage citizens and, and, uh, and companies uh, uh, to participate in, in, in support uh, to the army? First of all, maybe I shall clarify about what we are doing, because uh, mm -hmm. first of all, we emphasize things that are so-called uh, force multipliers. So we are providing reconnaissance UVs, communication equipment, secured laptops and so on. So it's a kind of, uh, definitely it doesn't uh, kill enemies on its own, but without this kind of equipment, you can, you can do modern combined arms warfare. As we see, but yes, we have a major success story because uh, we got the license for export import operation uh, to buy weaponry. And yes, we managed to buy on our own from Baikar Makina a set of uh, Bayraktar TB2 for main intelligence directorate. So they made a request and we do it. And yes, we have a kind of ambition to broaden the scope of our work uh, and uh, also to provide military with hardware to do its uh, job. As to what you said, well, uh, everything uh, changed on the 24th of February 2022. So before, definitely it was very difficult to sell to the people they need to invest in uh, national security and defense. I think it's natural. It's very difficult uh, to persuade people why you should uh, direct resources not in consumption, not in well-being, but in, uh, in the defense. So before the 24th of February 2022, we did quite a lot of job just to persuade business, for instance, to invest in the working of the charity. Then, of course, as Russia was uh, accumulating forces, deploying forces along the border of, uh, with Ukraine, 
uh, and uh, people start think about different scenarios. Yes, uh, the the flow of um, incomes it increased, but uh, uh, there was a mismatch between people's expectations. So people think it's very difficult to translate. Uh, more money accumulated into equipment here and now. So it took some time to translate uh, the new, new money into some kind of uh, uh, equipment because the process in the process, even if you work in a charity, still you need to undergo some kind of process. Uh, now we more or less uh, synchronized everything so it's uh, done in a, in a balanced uh, way. So we are contracting uh, the proper equipment uh, there is no shortage, there is no this gap between people just donating their money and waiting too much. And yes, we have uh, a number of projects uh, engaging private companies. So it's kind of private-private partnership, basically, like fueling stations. We have this uh, uh, fueling stations firm, OCO, and we are partner partnering with them. So they are advertising basically on their products, on their fueling stations, uh, our charity. And uh, together we are raising money and uh, translating them in this as that kind of uh, equipment. So right here, right now, there is no need to persuade Ukrainians to invest in defense. Uh, we have very solid work in relations with private uh, companies, with business. Uh, right here, right now, our major goal is uh, to go abroad, basically, to engage foreigners. That's why uh, our delegation was in the U.S. in June 2022, and we want to create some departments there. Uh, so it's uh, our next goal to engage not only uh, Ukrainians or uh, foreigners who are aware, already aware on the comeback alive, but to engage uh, wider audience as much as possible to make case uh, abroad and basically that is the reason that I appreciate this opportunity to to make a case for comeback alive here so that's our major major goal major ambition in the nearest future to engage as much as possible wider audience and I think we would be successful because as I said we are 100 percent transparent we are competent and uh, people can see where their money is uh, going and they can see it basically from the situation on the front line because without assistance provided by Comeback and Alive in terms of equipment I mentioned, it won't, Ukraine won't be as successful in both defense and offense. So it's a good kind of investment. We are quicker in reaction and we are trustworthy. Uh, we, we have... Uh, transparent reporting and so on. So our major ambition is to engage wider international audience. Very good. I think there's one more one more lesson what, what Macola is giving to us. And you, you, you notice that uh, basically previously we have been donating for, for social needs, for cultural needs. Uh, but right now NGOs are in to, to support defense. And uh, the second thing is probably that NGOs in Latvia, at least till now, they cannot get a, a import-export license for, uh, for strategic uh, products. So that was uh, one of the first challenges when uh, Latvian NGOs wanted to support Ukraine, they could not uh, get these licenses, and then we had good good support from our Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs uh, to help us out. And it was like a few weeks, uh, and, and government made a decision to change uh, this regulation. Uh, so, um, and. Uh, yeah, you mentioned you mentioned uh, going out uh, and and reaching out for for people. And uh, uh, last week, I also had a, a great opportunity to uh, to be at AUSA uh, annual meeting and uh, to see the the challenges what uh, American Army is facing and the way how they are approaching re resilience issues. And and it was also quite mind shifting for me because there was much larger openness when we have been uh, talking. Uh, uh, in, in probably in Latvia about things which we haven't done, which we haven't uh, reached, threats we haven't uh, uh, assessed. Uh, so there is usually this uh, attitude that if a uh, state institution will will uh, open up and say that, oh, we haven't done something, we haven't, uh, haven't identified some kind of risks, so that there will be a negativity from society. But uh, mainly I see that we could reach, uh, and especially uh, nowadays using this momentum, uh, 
far-reaching understanding from society so that society can really step in and accumulate resources for those uh, really important uh, needs. And therefore, yeah, what, regarding this, uh, this engagement and openness and, and trust, which you also mentioned, uh, how, how uh, UK is dealing with the, the, this? Uh, so I think it is, it is aspiring to deal with it, which is the first stage of dealing with it. It, it, is, it is really hard to build that trust between um, between independent companies and and governments, we made quite a lot of progress on cyber. We set up a national cyber security centre, which was designed specifically to be a point that was between government and businesses. We have a centre for the protection of national infrastructure, which has been there for for, for many years, um, and and we. We're really trying as well with this experimentation on the technical side to to get new tech which has defense capabilities. And that's where we are still struggling because we are too big and we are too slow. And as is NATO. I mean NATO is too big and it is too slow because the the life the the cycle the investment cycle of the young tech companies, as as you both know, is 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 very short and very quick and and national defence programmes are very long and very slow. So so we need to recognise that what happens next it, there's always an arms race. So what happens next will not be met with what we've already invented. We have to we have to see what's happening now and invent the new thing. And that's the bit which really does rely, as Michael I was saying, on the on the breaking of the existing structures and finding a way to bring in young technical innovation. And I just want to say something about protection of infrastructure. And we're seeing a fantastic example of the problem of this in Norway at the moment. Norway supplies now, um, it is the largest supplier of um, oil and gas to Europe. Um, the Norwegian oil companies, oil and gas companies, own the platforms they don't necessarily, there's a whole set of third parties involved. So it becomes very, very complicated. They don't necessarily control the pipelines and they're dependent on the Norwegian state for the investigation and the, and the real protection of that infrastructure. And I don't know whether you saw this week, but there have been rapidly increasing number of Russian drones over oil and gas installations. The seven Russians arrested recently. The Norwegian prime minister has, has come out and said, you know, foreign intelligence agencies are, are, are trying to um, undermine our infrastructure. That's a really important change, actually, and a recognition that the oil and gas companies and that the state are mutually dependent, but they so that you can't protect all that subsea infrastructure unless you have state capabilities under the sea to protect it as well. And I'm sure you know far more about that than I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially on, on uh, I think also U Ukraine case uh, shows that uh, sometimes you have to be just very, very innovative to fight. Yeah. And it's not all, 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 always those uh, uh, cl classical classical platforms uh, which are helping us out. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, has, this has been basically amazing platform for uh, Latvian companies also to uh, test their their new te technologies and. Uh, and uh, I see that uh, also the Latvian mobile telephone is is uh, doing a lot, so offering offering its support to the public sector. Maybe you could uh, share some of your experience. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, so uh, the military environment uh, is quite conservative. Mm. There are uh, objectives uh, behind that because uh, this is a, a huge system with a lot of people, a lot of uh, ammunition and, and equipment and weapons and so on. It's not so easy to cha make changes. However, the cooperation with the private sector, with the business and R&D sector is uh, nowadays giving some uh, positive uh, movements. And uh, first of all, uh, it's a smartphoneization of the uh, military uh, telecommunications systems. 
because for a very very long time uh, uh, when uh, each and every almost each and everybody had a smartphone in his pocket the military side was absolutely against it there were some uh, reasons and uh, one of the reasons uh, were mentioned quite often that uh, for example uh, uh, when uh, year 2000 uh, <clears throat> 14 and uh, uh, later the Donbass was uh, occupied and when the phone calls were made uh, uh, from the uh, front line uh, immediately after that uh, there were coming the strikes on, on that place. So uh, there was quite a simple technological explanation because the uh, Ukrainian and this Donbass uh, Donetsk area uh, mobile uh, telecom networks were connected to the uh, telco equipment which was placed in the territory of Russia. And of course, uh, all the calls were uh, under the supervision and under control of Russians. So when this uh, uh, connection was cut off, uh, this uh, stopped to happen. And uh, uh, smartphoneization is an uh, uh, excellent way how to uh, replace a big, uh, for instance, Harris uh, radio equipment and, and some other. Because what is the best uh, way where to hide the stone between other stones? <laughs> and uh, if in some cities there is a lot of... Uh, telephones, you cannot identify which is uh, military used on which is a regular civilian's phone. And with that, it's, it's, it's quite hard to identify uh, the phone. Another uh, direction which is nowadays very important is the development of new technologies, the 5G technology. And 5G technology, uh, by definition, it's, uh, it's uh, industrial. It's not for the private people, but, but mainly it's uh, for industrial purposes. And what we are uh, doing together uh, with the military forces, uh, uh, creating the uh, environment in uh, uh, close to Riga, in other military base, 5G uh, test bed, where it is possible to test different solutions uh, in the military area uh, based on, uh, on 5G technologies. We can use uh, command and control systems, we can uh, use autonomous vehicles, uh, we can use uh, drone management system and many, many other uh, virtual and augmented reality where even the uh, training from different uh, military groups in different countries can be uh, arranged and carried out at the same time in the virtual environment. So uh, all all these issues are, are very important and, and this is what we are doing together with our partners from the Ministry of Defense and, and the National Armed Forces. Yeah, it's like in investing in innovation and in creating a level field for, for other sm uh, small and uh, medium-sized companies to, to, to test technology, and not only on Latvian level, but also on the NATO scale. And that's, yeah. that's uh, I can add that uh, this smartphoneization or, or uh, 5G uh, usage for the military purposes is also recognized on the top level by NATO. <coughs> and this NI NIAG group, or uh, NATO, in this industry uh, advisors group uh, is setting up the research projects uh, how to uh, all around the uh, alliance uh, to uh, investigate and to research how these uh, technological solutions can be used on the top level for all the NATO countries. Yes. And we are part of this uh, research project.
Yeah. So, uh, because Susan also mentioned that there was times when, and these times were not far ago, that was December of the last year, January, when we had all the buzz around in Europe around the uh, taxonomy, where basically defense business was an ethical business and and we lacked resources and finances. And right now we see that there's this, this movement of finance sector towards defense industry is also quite positive. So it's not just civ uh, civilians, but also financial sector is uh, looking much more, uh, with, as I say, eyes wide open towards the, the defense sector and and also the availability of uh, financial resources uh, for co companies to step in and take their responsibility in security is, uh, is also uh, very necessary and there are a lot of support instruments both in European Defense Fund and right now uh, coming up with this uh, NATO initiative for Diana and uh, uh, NATO Innovation Fund. So, so we have also a few, few minutes left and I really see that there are amazing audience here and uh, yeah, please go with your question and present yourself and maybe you have immediately question to some of us. Yes, uh, Thomas Armolavijus from ICDS Think Tank in Thailand. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about maybe uh, or hear your thoughts about another very conservative part of this uh, public part of um, private uh, ecosystem and it is banking industry. Because in the wartime it's not only the supplies have to move around but money has to move around. And we experienced already firsthand how, you know, of course, the banking industry has obligations uh, in relation to anti-money laundering uh, legislation, uh, know your customer obligation and so on. And then you have a, 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 such a thing like war in Ukraine and then it gets, you know, all its algorithms become confused because all sorts of charities start buying things they shouldn't, uh, so not supposed to buy, you know, getting the money from all the sources, they're not supposed to get it and so on. So those algorithms become really confused and, it, you know, get entangled into this banking sort of nightmare. Now, uh, I want to hear whether, you know, in Ukraine, come back alive has experience negative or positive with... Um, Ukrainian and foreign uh, banks and banking industry in, 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 in these financial transactions. Uh, in the UK, is there a sort of some forum where a banking industry is engaged in a conversation about, about uh, this, this aspect? And in the Baltic states, where the banks have really burned their fingers with these massive money laundering scandals of the, of the last decade, uh, it, it has become very overly cautious. Is there a way to sort of knock them out of this stupor and, and, and show that in wartime, they have to do things very differently uh, compared to the peacetime uh, framework. So basically, you know, question to all three of you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, but yeah, Mikolas, probably you, would, you could be the first to, to, to answer. How have you been doing with this financial sector? Uh, well, um, actually there is no difference in Ukraine, so yes, uh, worried or not, but banking and this whole infrastructure, they are very careful, they are very watchful, and yes, it took some time for them to get permissions and to agree with these transactions. Uh, well, as I said, uh, we are flexible, but we can't remove uh, any obstacles, any, any roadblocks and so on. We are in a dialogue with uh, uh, lawmakers, with uh, bureaucracy, with the government. But again, we, we'd like to streamline the whole process, uh, banking process, incredibly. But uh, since uh, we need to, uh, we need to upkeep the, the image uh, and uh, the, the trust. So we need to also adhere to the regulations. So we are trying to streamline the process. We are trying to lobby to persuade legislatures and the bureaucrats to change some regulations. But again, in the meantime, we also have to comply. Yes, uh, it uh, uh, broaden the, the scope, it broaden the process, it delays some deliveries, but uh, to, to be the uh, the lawful, uh, law abiding uh, player, we also adhere to these regulations at the same time, persuading to uh, persuading uh, the players to change the process. Thank you. What about you, Yuris? Do you see that banks are changing or? 
there are several uh, issues, like is, it was also stated uh, partly uh, is in the question. Uh, there are this uh, anti-money uh, laundering and, uh, and anti-terrorism and uh, proliferation and whatever what we know. But I will talk a little bit more about the f uh, technological issues, because uh, we all know that in reality nobody is carrying um, cash back and forth with uh, diligence like in Wild West. Uh, the, all the transactions mostly are uh, carried out by the electronic means. And uh, I have to come back uh, with what I started my today's uh, discussion. It's cybersecurity. Cybersecurity uh, is a very important issue and uh, the weak, weakest uh, part of this change is not so much uh, 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 banking systems, but there are people. There are people who are uh, uh, still trusting in the wonder that somebody, his uncle uh, or his or her uncle from Nigeria will offer the heritage in 10 million pounds and so on. And uh, people who are cheating this way, they are very good psychologists. They are managing to convince people to discover their data. It's a very, very hard uh, issue and a uh, complicated issue and it's a matter of education and uh, uh, both banks and uh, tel telco companies uh, who are uh, basically are uh, connecting with the people and who always are receiving complaints that why somebody called me and offered me money and uh, gave nothing. So this is a matter of education. In fact, the educated nations are better uh, protected and defended from the external and internal dangers than, than uh, nations which are not smart and trained. Yeah. Um, going a little bit to, to, to this, this issue, I would say that, of course, everybody would love to have a LMT as a client from bank, banking sector. But of, but of course, Thomas, we have faced these, uh, these issues in, uh, in, uh, in, in our companies in even uh, May and, and, and even uh, in September. I, I have had to intervene in, and support companies to solve issues with the banks because some of the banks have even... Uh, not ready for those uh, anti-money laundering procedures, so they do not trust uh, themselves and, and, and uh, they do not trust uh, the clients. So basically, uh, that's the only only opportunity for us to communicate with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs to, to support and and, uh, and educate each other. So, but yeah. Well, it is. So it isn't in any of our interests to have unregulated banking of um, movements of weapons or other military capabilities in any form. And I remember when I was working on counterterrorism, Daesh, the Islamic State in, uh, in Iraq and Syria, they were buying their drones uh, on Alibaba. They were ordering them. They were being delivered to Turkey. They were then collecting them, sending them back. And they really pioneered and developed the drone swarming, the use, dro using drones to drop grenades into APCs and things. So, so that's that's what happens if we don't police the system. It is, though, really important. This comes back to the partnership like never before, because it is really important that the tech companies, the arms companies, that the legitimate business is able to speak to governments and to finance houses, so that all involved understand that this is desirable business, exactly as you were saying. Yeah. So there was like one more question from you, please. Uh, yes, yeah, Yep. Uh, John Rain from the double IWS. Uh, I also happen to be an advisor and non-executive for a bank, so I'm going to pick up on that comment. Uh, first of all, just to say that it was uh, fascinating to see banks react in Russia, where they move from, I think, a position of caution to a position of self-sanctioning very quickly. Um, and, and a big thing is happening, certainly in international banking, which is an awareness of 
your accountability to your shareholders, but also of the long-term penalties that you will pay because of regulatory fees if you're not in compliance. Um, they have almost incidentally become part of the arsenal with which we are now fighting Russia. Um, but there are jurisdictions, jurisdictions, there are banks, there are banks. Often the problems are created because of the difference in regulatory frameworks. So I suppose I'm saying banks aren't always the villains. But my question to the panel is <laughs> fascinating to hear the conversation. Um, a, a lot of you are talking really about a real shift in the concept of national defence, away from something that we leave to the military to something which the citizenry do. For many European countries who are not in the front line, that's a long journey. And perhaps the longest journey is for Germany. So if Olaf Schulz were here, what would you say to him about starting that journey? What should he be saying to the German people and to German industry? Good question. For three, in, in, in the rest three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, they have to look a little bit back in the history. Uh, we know that the main uh, conclusion from the history is that nobody is learning from the history. Uh, and the uh, expectation that everything will be fine and uh, nothing will touch us, it's uh, not a serious approach. Uh, especially considering that uh, nowadays the, the world is really global and everything is connected together. As mentioned, banking's, uh, banking systems are global. Uh, air <coughs> airplanes, uh, flights are global. Uh, telecommunications are global. Uh, ICT industry is global. So, and it means that uh, in each and every country, there are vulnerable places which can be attacked, not from inside, but from outside. And if you are not prepared for that, don't imagine that it will not touch you. It's wrong approach. You have to be prepared for that. Yeah. You? Well, I completely agree with you. I suppose my reflection would be that Germany is still a new country. It's only been unified for 30 years. Mm. And sometimes we, we forget that. And that fracture is really evident, I think, even today, in the way that people who live in different parts of Germany approach things. Um, I think it is now it is going through a process of, of realising what it means to be a modern nation state that has to fight to defend democracy. And I hope that he is able to become a leader of, of young Germany, in a way, and, and to, to sell that vision to his people about their role in, in that fight. Great, Mikolas. <laughs> what you would say? Well, uh, Ukrainians are consistent in, the, in our message. So on the one hand, we appreciate what we received because we received quite a lot from Germany if we compare with other European countries. Uh, but uh, we also would say, please invest in armament industry and approve decisions to supply Ukraine with heavy weaponry. And so if you invest in Ukrainian defense, maybe you, you don't need to change your own country way of business in national security that much. So just make us do your, our job and you don't need to change radically your own country. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for, for being part of this debate. And um, I really hope that we all encouraged both NGOs, businesses and uh, civil, civil society to be engaged in creating this national security altogether. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.